afternoon and good evening to everyone. Hi, I'm David Chavez. I'm Senior Fellow at Community Science, and I'm excited to be here with my colleagues today um, to talk about something that is so basic, um, so fundamental to the human experience, and so important to all of us in these times right now. Um, at first, I want to uh, introduce a key person in this webinar, uh, Dante Cowens, who will be uh, the mastermind behind the scenes moving everything. Dante? Hello, everyone. Um, as David said, my name is Dante, and I'll be doing the technical assistance. I'll be behind the scenes. So basically, I'll ensure that the Q&A works, um, which we're going to have at the end. And then at, you'll see at the bottom, there's some closed captions. If you click that, you can um, use that as the panelists speak today, and I look forward to um, hearing more, and I'll pass it to Marisa. Hi, y'all. Thank you for joining us. So my name is Marisa Salasad. Uh, my pronoun, pronouns are she, her, and I'm an associate here at Community Science. And I specialize in advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion in um, organizations through things like research, uh, strategy development, evaluation, and leadership development. So thank you. I'll pass it over to you, Kian. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Kian Lee. I'm Vice President of Consulting here at Community Science. Very excited to talk about a topic that's near and dear to all of us. And I'm looking forward to um, this time with my colleagues and getting questions from everybody. Um, just want a quick introduction to community science. We're all about effective strategies, equitable systems, and strong communities. Um, we are head, we are a BCT Partners company headquartered in Maryland with staff pretty much all over the country right now. Turn it back to David. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ken. And um, I should also say that I lead our equitable community development group and, and been working on really how to focus on building and strengthening communities, um, both economically through housing and power building. And as well as I said, economic development. Our agenda today is we just completed our welcomes and introductions. I'll be going over the key takeaways. Um, we'll talk about why it's important to focus on community now, something we take for granted, but is so critical to our human existence and our collective existence. We'll talk about a definition of sense of community that's been based on a well-tested theory, how to measure and assess it, and then finally what's next as we begin to take this work further. Our key takeaways for today are that we're going to really begin to, we, we're introducing community sense of community, not as something new, but as a, as a way to be able to take existing approaches to organizational and community development and improve them by creating a framework that really enables for broader uh, attention to the needs of people and a more inclusive approach. Um, we're going to provide a research-based and applicable approach that's, that has been shown across cultures and contexts. Mm -hmm. We're not saying this is a panacea nor easy. It has challenges, but it has such great potential because it is so fundamental that it's actionable. We'll talk about how it's actionable now in a subsequent uh, webinar that we'll be doing in June, and that it's also measurable, something that we can assess where, where different settings are and their sense of community. Why community now? Why are we focusing on it? I want to talk about my own personal experience starting as, uh, and we're going to take this from both a personal as well as professional approach to some of the issues that, that our country, our society, our world are facing right now. This ongoing issues of social and environmental justices that we have throughout the US, so many different issues. When I started as a community organizer many years ago in Buffalo, New York, I learned three very important factors. The power of information and knowledge, um, the power of knowing what side you're on in a social conflict and the power of community that I saw as through both as a local organizer as well as a student of history, how the best and worst in human experience have come by developing that sense of community and people taking action together in their common interests. We've seen things at the local level to the national level. I've also seen people come together across different barriers people in neighborhoods where we saw white and black communities where they were at odds, but at the same time found the commonalities around taking care of their children and through that process began to learn about each other. 
I want I often tell people if you want that experience of how can we deal with some of these issues and justice issues to really begin to look at some of the you know that process you can see um, through even popular films like Remember the Titans or The Best of en en Enemies. I really encourage people to look at that to see how how examples from real life of how these things really happen all the time and yet we put them aside because they you know they just don't sound so technical and basics. Um, we're also in a time where we, where the Surgeon General has reported and others about this increased loneliness and alienation. And res research after research for the last almost 200 years has shown that developing that sense of community and all the ways that we've defined it in the social, social sciences, sciences have been fundamental and important in our physical, social, and psychological development. That these are critical factors for our well-being and it's something we can do something about. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, I come to this topic and this issue also in a different, in a in a slightly different way. I came to this country first as an international student, then stayed as an immigrant, and after that, a naturalized citizen. I've encountered situations where I've been I felt welcome, um, as well as situations where I felt objectified and as an outsider. Um, I've been made to feel like a member and not a member when I'm in places where nobody looks like me. But it also in places that I think people look like me, for example, when I'm working in Asian communities, because the Asian community is not homogenous. Um, and so there are those boundaries and who's in and who's out in which Asian community. I've also witnessed immigrant families disassociating themselves from the concerns of their black neighbors, because those neighbors, quote unquote, are different and their problems are not pro uh, their problems are not ours right so these boundaries of who's in and who's out can be very stark and if you deviate from the norms of the in group you're really seen in a negative light um today these boundaries i think are even more defined because of cultural clashes political allegiances and other differences due to race religion socioeconomic status gender and more um but at the same time, I've also seen people who are perceived as different from one another actually come together to solve a problem that affects all of them. And then to develop relationships and to understand each other as people and not who they think they represent. Um, through the process of discussing how these problems affect all of them, they learn um, you know, to find common ground. Um, a community that we worked in years ago in Massachusetts was very interesting because it had newcomers, very new, recent newcomers, and very long time established people who've been there for generations. And the two communities um, were divided physically by a hill, an actually hill, so that the haves lived on top of the hill and the have nots lived at the bottom of the hill. And it was through a community organizing strategy that the people started to understand that they actually shared something in common. An issue that came up for them was how their kids would have to walk to school, but their kids were often in danger because the snow was not plowed. And so the kids would have to walk on the road with the cars and that was dangerous for them. They found that they, they all wanted something for their kids, right? They wanted their kids to be safe. And this was a common issue that brought them together. And in doing so actually was able to advocate collectively to get their local elected official to do something about that problem. Other things turned out like they got to know each other as neighbors. And there was one story about how members of the Daughters of the American Revolution actually reached out and invited their newcomer neighbors to come to a meeting for the first time. And they sat next to each other to talk to each other and learn about each other's life experiences and how they came to that community. So in those situations, I feel hopeful. I see the importance of sense of community and how as we expand that boundary of who's in, um, we actually um, can get to more inclusion and with more inclusion, fight for the things that we all want for our families and our children. Marisa. All right. So why community now overcoming backlash towards DEI strategies? So I'm a DEI professional. I evaluate and consult organizations on their DEI strategies. So this one hits deep. Um, I'm also part of an organization, as I'm sure a lot of us in this room likely are. And I know that organizations are communities, right? So 
even with the rise of remote work, the research shows that across all generations, we still see our workplace as a source of building community and connection. And that's certainly the case for me, right? And it makes sense. We share a lot of struggles together at work and achievements together as well. And sometimes, you know, you see your coworkers more than you do your family members um, some days. So, you know, for some folks right now, um, or for, for a long while, actually, um, DEI strategies are perceived as a zero sum game, um, which translates to dominant majority groups within an organization perceiving DEI outcomes as taking away or reducing the benefits or opportunities that they have, right? So, hey, if you ha get X benefit at my organization, that's at the expense of me, and I don't like that. And then you also have folks who are involved in DEI work who are also sometimes saying, you know, hey, you know, not all these. DEI efforts have been as fruitful as we would have liked them to be, with some of us even adding things like belonging as a focus to try to improve these outcomes, right? So there is this just sense that something might be missing. And oftentimes it, it kind of does feel like trying to capture lightning in the bottle uh, for many organizations who sometimes have been trying for years to make progress on DEI efforts and growing backlash from you know, both folks of like people who are saying you're doing too much and others who are saying you're not doing enough, right? So it's just not landing the way that it needs to for staff. Um, and then you speak to staff and, and even they're sometimes having a hard time pinpointing why it's not working. Um, they'll say things like, you know, it's just not authentic or you're, we just don't trust, you know, what the organization is doing. So that brings me to, you know, why are we talking about it right now or talking about sense of community right now and how is it useful? And for me, when I think of the sense of community uh, theory, which we'll talk about next, um, it focuses on things like, you know, needs and uh, power and influence, emotional connection. And it really just operationalizes a lot of the tangibles that I often find myself feeling as I exist within an organization, as well as seeing when I'm working with organizations. Um, so yeah, that's why community is important right now in the workplace as well. So I'll pass it over to you, David. Great, Great. thank you so much, Marisa. And I wanna say that the, at the heart of this is the idea that we're all in it together. That is the essence we're trying to say. And what we have now is a time when we need to be able to have a social uh, community and organizational strategies that really embraces the totality of our experience to be together. We, we share in the goal of Dr. Martin Luther King that our goal is to create a beloved community. And this will require a qualitative change in our souls as well as a quantitative change in our lives. Okay. Um, back in, way back when, <laughs> um, um, David McMillan, who was also a graduate school at Peabody, uh, had just finished when I was uh, just starting, uh, had developed uh, around, looked at the social psychological literature and, um, and, and found that in that literature, um, that there were four elements that later I went on to look broader in the social sciences and that we'll talk about the history of this that really there were four major elements to a sense of community. And I'm gonna start with what I think is the core of it, which is the fulfillment of needs and the sharing of values. Communities are driven by needs, by people's needs, and around the values of what they think are most important. There's a sense of membership that comes from that, from developing a sense of being a community, that feeling, you can't just declare it. It comes through that process of people sharing a common identity. They belong to that group. They're from that neighborhood. They belong to that religious group or that ethnic group or that football team. That is part of who they are. They have a clear idea of who belongs and who doesn't belong, who's in and out, which is one of the challenges that we face in developing community because given its power, it also has that other edge to it. But it's also important to know that through the common symbols, through signs, through language, through all these other things that people come together um, to develop that sense of, of belonging. And with that sense of boundaries and who ins and outs comes what's most important, that sense of trust and security that comes from knowing who's part of your community. We are in it together. The third component, the third element 
is that sense of influence and something that's really very important that we often get hidden behind things, that people know that their voices count, that there's a sense that I as an individual as part of this collective, and we often talk about collective efficacy, that collective efficacy comes from community, that people like me can achieve things together, okay? And if not my leadership, our leadership can take care of it for us, okay? And we're also greatly influenced by that community as well, okay? And finally, in the essence of the community is that shared emotional connection, that feeling of a connection that is created through the sharing of experience that are important to the people themselves, the participants, not some artificial games that are created as part of an exercise, but things, experiences that are important to them, that they see as important. Often, unfortunately, often that comes through a sense of disaster, but it also comes through the victory of winning and achieving things. And it also comes through that shared history, that shared history of oppression as well as success. Often we see that in the black community or in the Jewish community or in the gay community, those kind of connections of a shared experience tie people together who have never been together before. And it shows the potential of what we can do as a nation, as well as local communities, as well as organizations. Communities are nested, and we always, this is like probably the whole story. And it's because these Russian uh, dolls, you often see nested dolls, because we don't have one community. We have the family as the fundamental unit, often, whatever, however, uh, typical uh, families and all different kind of family configurations, your neighborhood, your city, your state, that these things are together. And we live in different communities, as Marisa and Kian talked about, we pass through organizations, we pass through many communities, and there's not a limit to how many we can have that connection with. They're just different for different times of our lives and different uh, age groups and different populations. Which communities are most important to us are going to change and are different. And so our job is to really create community wherever people are, inclusive, accepting, diverse communities. Now I'm going to turn over to Marisa, who's going to talk about the measurement and assessment of a sense of community. Awesome. All right, so how do we measure and assess the sense of community? So the sense of community index is actually the most frequently used measure to gauge a sense of community. It was developed by Community Science, which is awesome. Um, and it's a survey index, meaning that typically it's distributed via a survey format. And once you take the survey, what it would then produce for you is an overall sense of community score, along with a score for each of the four sense of community elements, including things, you know, like we just covered, membership, fulfillment of needs, influence, and shared emotional connection. There's also two versions of the sense of community index. There's the SCI one and the SCI two. And uh, the difference between the two is just that the SCI one is the first version and the sense of community two or the SCI two is the second more improved version. So the original mm -hmm. sense of community index um, is a 12 item index and it has a lot of great things going for it. So it is theory based, it's short and easy to administer, it's statistically reliable and valid, it's found to have all sorts of relationships with things like behaviors and community conditions and psychological well-being. And it's been used successfully across multiple um, cultures and contexts. And the sense of community two, the SCI two, has all of the benefits of the sense of community one or the SCI one, um, but it's improved, right? So it has 24 items. And with that, it has improved subscale reliability. It has improved um, response set options and it has uh, improvements to the survey items themselves. So uh, we made them closer to the sense of community theory and to also reflect more of the developments that happened in the field um, since the first one. And it's just more clear. So it's clear for both the researcher in terms of interpreting the, the data as well as the, you know, the user and user experience. All right, so 
we are very proud to say that, you know, the sense of community to or the SAI to has been used widely across the world. Um, so the last time that we checked, uh, there was over 58 published articles from 2008 to 2019 and counting because we know that there are more out there. And David, you were just telling me <laughs> about an even bigger, grander number of the sense of community index broadly. Yeah. And it's saying 19,000, according to Google, it was 19,000 citations for it globally. So we'll check yeah. on that. But yeah. Yeah. But for the broad, for broadly, both of the indices, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Um, so we also have had over 800 requests since 2011, um, with several coming in every single week to use the sense of community indices. Um, we also have, or we've seen this applied in multiple settings, you know, uh, for example, schools, military bases, rural villages, the workplace, et cetera. And it's been translated into 15 languages, um, including French, Korean, Spanish, and Vietnamese. And mind you that our translations are required to go through scientific procedures, including forward and reverse translation techniques so that they're linguistically and culturally appropriate. Um, it's also been applied you know, across the world, um, both in online global communities and in over 18 countries, including Egypt, Laos, uh, Portugal, Sri Lanka, and the United States. There have also been some really interesting applications of the Sense of Community Index, so we wanted to spend a little bit of time there as well. So the Sense of Community Index has been applied to a variety of settings that we covered before, like from gardening clubs to, you know, universities, neighborhoods, you name it, it's likely been <laughs> applied to it, um, but also some interesting examples that have happened over the past few decades um, include, for example, you know, use in uh, wars, right, before and after uh, mine removal. So specifically for this example, communities use the sense of community index to observe how their sense of community differed before and after mines were removed from their community. And this particular example as well is of note because it came from the Bosnian war period and the work was funded by uh, the Princess Di Foundation. Is that right, David? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it was also in, in, in Cambodia as well, in addition to Oh, that, and Cambodia as well. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yep, so a lot of very interesting applications. And then uh, the next one is participation in student movements. For example, in Cairo, the Sense of Community Index was administered to assess changes in the sense of community uh, among students who participated in Arab Spring, right? Um, you also have Owens Corning. Uh, so it was used at the Owens Corning Company, which is famous for its pink fiberglass, which is pretty <laughs> cool. Uh, you all know it. Um, and insulation products. And it was administered to its employees after it went through a major organizational transition to, uh, you know, 16,000 employees in 28 countries over or on five different continents, which is pretty impressive. Um, and then finally, uh, another one we wanted to, to share briefly is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has used it for its National Survey of Health Attitudes, which seeks to advance its overall like culture of health strategy, um, which I'm sure a lot of people are, are very you know, familiar with. Um, but those are some of the more interesting applications. I don't know if Kiana and David, if you have any others that come to mind. Yeah. No, so, good, these, these are, are the, the ones. These are the fun ones. <laughs> these are the unusual every, ones. Um, it's launched, I can't say that it's launched thousands of dissertations. It seems I think that it was one on a military yeah. base. I think with, yeah. with, with, with on, on military basis, we've seen that too. Yeah. And okay. all sorts of clubs, yacht clubs, many different things. Yeah. Yes, I've seen a lot of very interesting yeah. applications. I should say, Marisa is uh, is the uh, person, as we're on this point, who manages our, our website and, and goes through the process. Talk yes. about. And this is, um, we want to include a page in here to just show you where to find the Sense of Community Index one or two, if you're interested in learning more about them, or if you want to use it, please just visit our website, senseofcommunity.com. We also wanted to make you aware that we have um, a Sense of Community to our SEI2 global benchmarking study. So now that we, the index has been out, 
and use long enough, we can start uh, benchmarking scores, which means offering the ability to name what are typical scores for different types of communities um, so that you can better understand, let's say if you're looking at a residential community and you wanna know how your residential community score is comparable to other similar residential communities, that's what we're hoping to be able to offer. Um, and finally, for this part of um, the webinar, we wanted to say that while the sense of community is uh, index is the most widely used, it is certainly not the only uh, measure available. So we have here the brief sense of community scale and the three factor psychological sense of community scale. They work in a very similar way and distributed um, most typically, you know, through the survey format again. Um, and there's also other similar constructs out there. They're not going to cover all of the dimensions, right? But they're they're similar and you hear about them um, and they're widely used. Things like neighborhood cohesion or social co cohesion, for example, comes to mind. Um, so yeah. And then we also wanted to mention that self-assessment and surveys are not the only ways to assess a sense of community. Um, so using the sense of community theory, especially to ground you, you can also test these concepts using unobtrusive and other measures such as um, focus groups and interviews and observational methods. So for example, for focus groups and interviews, you can just directly ask folks about the various elements of a sense of community and for observational methods, um, you can collect evidence on various symbols or behaviors that demonstrate a sense of community through things like observations or photographs, right? So for example, you might take a photograph of community events um, or what folks are wearing within the community, um, or you might observe that all the houses are painted in pastels, like in the painted ladies in San Francisco, right? To symbolize some sort of, you know, membership within a community, for example. So there are many ways, you know, to assess um, a sense of community that are not just the SEI2 is, is our point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Um, so I want to share what's coming up next. Um, so you've learned today about the sense of community. And this sense of community and the index really forms the basis of what we call the strength of community framework. The strength of community framework um, looks like this. And what we're saying basically is that, you know, we want to, if you, if you develop a sense of community in every setting, in any setting, what we're able to do is expand the boundaries of the community to become more inclusive so that more and more people can see themselves as part of a growing larger community, right? And as their ex experience of membership, right? Feeling like they're part of this community, that influence, that they can influence decisions that affect them, um, of their um, connection, that their shared emotional connection and their meeting of needs and shared values through this community, what will happen is also they'll be more inclined to act collectively, right? To, because now they care for one another and they'll connect more. And in doing so, be able to start asserting control over their lives, over their community conditions, and then enhancing their economic conditions and generate more cash. Hence the five C's as we call it. And with these five C's, their psychological, physical, social well-being and their social environment will also become better and will improve. And so that's the idea of this strength of community framework. We're focusing on the bonding, the bridging, and then the linking, because if you link to the systems that are supposed to respond to communities needs, support them, um, then you will be able to affect um, decisions that kind of have you'll be able to influence decisions that affect your lives. Um, and because you care about one another, you hope that you will influence decisions that affect everybody and not just your community or your in-group or whatever, which then will help us make progress towards equity and justice. And so that's the idea of this framework. Um, we, we're not you know, suggesting that there needs to be new, entirely new strategies or new interventions. There are many effective strategies that are currently happening in the workplace, organizations, in communities um, that can be put together in a more holistic way and in a more intentional way so that we can actually use sense of community as a way to get to equity and justice. And that's what we're proposing. And that's what we're going to discuss at our next webinar. 
which will be, uh, let me get back to that slide, on June 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted just for, for time, just because there's a group of questions that clumped around the use of the SCI-1 and SCI-2, um, I just thought I would jump in and since we have some time and just answer those questions around the process since that's what they're uh, addressing. Um, and so, um, and it's a little bit going back to uh, what Marisa had said earlier is that well, how we move from the SCI-1 to the SCI-2. And this is probably the toughest set of questions <laughs> that uh, we have to deal with. Um, one of the things that was happening, um, the question is about you know, are there, do you have to use all the 12 to 24 items or your recommendations if someone needs to capture the con construct in one or two questions? Um, and the I want to explain a little background to that because what we found is that um, um, is that people were taking it as part of that process of getting their dissertations and stuff is that doing factor analysis and breaking it up and changing it and calling it the sense of community index, but it was a different uh, instrument. So once you change items, you use less, it's not the same instrument. And we really wanted to maintain the, um, the integrity, the scientific integrity of these, these, uh, uh, these two instruments. And so we don't give permission to break them up and take pieces of it because it's a whole theory. Okay. It's not like three or four questions are better than others in taking a theoretical approach to it. Um, and then people would then change it and, and call it something else because they took four or five questions and then made a new, new uh, questionnaire out of that. So in general, we take control of that because we want to be able to build the theory and build the use of it. It's not, it's free. It doesn't save us. It's not a monetary thing. It's about the integrity of the work. Now to answer the question directly, um, yes, there's one question, which is how high <laughs> is your sense of, if you want one question is how strong your sense of community from not at all to the very top, um, you know, to completely and, and using a self-anchoring scale of not at all to fully um, is a way to do that. And in fact, that my dissertation, part of my dissertation use that uh, single item. Um, so if you want to do that, that's it. But as far as um, the question of being able to take pieces, we really don't uh, allow for taking pieces of it. It's been used, it's been used now in terms of the languages and the use of it. It's been used with like, with, with younger people, um, as young as 12, as I believe, and it's been used with adults, homeless people, all different populations. The way that we address, is another question uh, asked about how do we address the different references, is we ask people to think about the community up front. One of the first questions is, what community are you referring to? When we talk about community, this is what we're referring to, so that they understand when the word community is used, what we're referring to in that. Um, and, uh, the comprehensive, so we got a sense of that it's, it's at least gone through a sixth grade comprehensive level when we did the testing for it, um, uh, how, and the other question by Del, uh, Dolores about, um, you know, do we have it available in American sign language? No, we don't, but we would love to be able to talk to you about how to do that. So, um, and the person, Marisa handles the request through the, um, through the website, senseofcommunity.com, and related to another question is how will you receive an email to let us know the decision? Absolutely. Um, speaking of Marisa, she gets back to you as soon as we can as you go through that process, uh, as long as you sign and agree to it. Because a big part of what we're trying to do, as Marisa said, is really be able to share the information. The questions we get in addition to um, can we do it in less questions, the number of questions, how does this compare to other communities? How does this compare to youth groups, different populations? And the benchmarking study that we hope everybody that uses the instrument will participate in helps us identify the different scores because there isn't a perfect score for every community and every group. Um, so that is, you'll hear shortly after that about that. Uh, you hear shortly about that and hope that you'll participate in the study. Okay. So I just want to cover those, if, uh, Dante, or I just want to cover the non. Um, I'll just and add, 
Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'll add to that. Um, in addition to American Sign Language or other languages that it's not available in, um, that we are very open uh, to having those translations or for you to complete those translations as long as they follow those procedures I talked about previously. But we're very open to it. We would like for this to be applied in as many settings as possible. So just wanted to name that. Okay. I Go ahead. Sorry, Dante. No, you're good. Um, do you have anything you want to add? No. Uh -uh. Okay. Um, yeah, so we do have a few more questions. Um, and I think you've already answered this, but it says sometimes there's conflict between the need to care for oneself or the community slash others. How do you find a way to balance these needs? Now, turn that question to the whole panel. I actually see this connected to the other question about how does the strength of community framework, which is not explicit about race or racism, affect racially discriminatory policy to get to equity and justice. So I'll take a stab at it, and then maybe um, the two of you can add to it. I, I think that underneath the strength of community framework, obviously, are a lot more details, right? As David loves to say, the angels in the details. Um, When we talk about communities coming together to figure out who's in, who's out. In that process of figuring out who's in, who's out, you do have to deal with some of these um, isms um, and talk about it and have conflict transformation um, strategies. And so the idea is that you want to deal with these conflicts and these misperceptions of people and the history that has contributed to some of these discrimination and oppression of people to come to a place where people actually can see themselves as part of a bigger community, that they have shared values. Um, like the story I, I said before, the tension between the newcomers and longtime residents in this place, newcomers were primarily from Latin America and the longtime residents were actually people who migrated there and lived in there for a long, long time. And they didn't see themselves as, as, as um, part of a bigger community, but through the process of a strategy like community organizing, which is power building strategy, you can find those commonalities and work through them. And it's working through them that you come to an understanding of what you share together, um, despite what you think you don't share, and that you start to care for one another. And if you care for one another, then your problem becomes my problem. Um, and we got to then resolve this together. And that's really what we're working towards in this framework. Um, it looks simple. It is not that simple. Um, it is complex, um, but it is possible. Um, and it is something that we feel that is needed in order to get there today because of the major differences, clashes, and polarization that we are seeing in this country and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. We'll see if David and Marisa have anything to add. Marisa? No, then, you know, I'll jump in. I think it's really turned to the question about race. I think it's the, the let's say the research is really very inconclusive. In fact, is it necessary to deal with racism and discrimination directly, explicitly? Does that get results, especially in groups that haven't historically embraced that um, that position? Okay. And, and in fact, what the research does show us is a lot of backlash to that explicitness. But it also, on the flip side of that, is that by building community, by having shared, by having positive experiences together, attitudes about different races and attitudes towards addressing racism has changed. So the question is, do you have to hit the hammer, uh, the nail on the head, in order to get to get your point across? And I think the research shows us that by building those positive events uh, for people to squirk on common problems together that they're able to um, improve, ch that, that is shown that attitudes do change again, and that there's sympathies and support because we are in it together. You're more like, so much of the red and blue can be who we see as community. We see uh, maybe that red position is, that conservative position is, we got to take care of our own and it's smaller while, you know, uh, what we call the blue position, you know, in other states are more a matter of, caring about others and seeing that larger sense of community because we've had that shared positive experience and we see that larger issues, uh, as common issues about that. The other thing I want to say about is that it's a dynamic process. So how do you deal taking care of yourself? 
there's not a solution. That is that has to do with leadership and the process within a community, because issues continuously will arise in a community, and an active, strong community will be able to um, be able to address that balance between taking care of needs. We work in a project where communities really focus on on issues of uh, immigration, uh, of refugees of, of ICE coming in to their communities. Um, and that's where a lot of the people want to take action right away during the pandemic. But a lot of the people also said, we don't have food, we don't have shelter. You know, um, and so what they did was is that they first worked on taking care of their community members and those stresses and dealing with, with trauma. So I think it's really about being when we begin to get underneath the hood of the strengthening community and understand community, it's how the leadership and the processes within that community that continuously adopts the changes in the environment and be able to care for its members by caring for everybody at the same time, because again, everyone is in it together. Marisa, anything add? I think that um a lot of the things that we're talking about now, I, I'm expecting for us to also cover in a lot more detail in the next webinar as well of like how the how of it all. When I think about the application to the workplace, I think that, you know, a sense of community is is interesting because it's both an outcome as well as the process, right? So at the same time that we're trying to let's say advance you know a sense of community within the workplace you're also having to kind of use those elements to check yourself as well and what i mean by that is if you're going to let's say even start an initiative where you want to improve emotional connection let's just say and uh you know you say okay at the beginning of every single meeting that you all have we're going to have 10 minutes just dedicated to working on like non-work related or not working talking talking about non-work related topics right and that's just it and you just decide that you are going to implement that as a leader and just expect everybody to to follow suit and maybe it just does not land the way it needs to land you had that in mind you had sense of community in mind you wanted to build emotional connection and membership the two elements of a sense of community, but you weren't hitting those other elements, right? You weren't assessing, is this an actual need for folks right now? Is Did they have any sort of influence on this decision? And I think that a lot of, you know, the next webinar, as well as when I'm hearing these questions has to do with, are you hitting all those elements when trying to make change as well, right? When you're trying to build an even bigger community, are you also um, moving forward with shared values? Are you moving forward with, um, you know, fulfillment of needs for each group? Are you hitting that shared emotional connection or having opportunities to build that emotional connection? And are you sharing power, right? So I think those are also more broadly just kind of what I have to contribute. But I think, again, in that next webinar, we'll probably get more into the details of what that can look like. Thank you. And if I yeah. can just build on that, I think it's a great point because you you raised something that we didn't, we only touched on briefly, which is the reason why we focus on developing the subscales of the elements was so that they're more useful. As di At this point, we're talking about as an assessment. Um, and next session, we'll talk about using these these measures and these uh, these measurement tools as ways to evaluate. But here it's a way to think about it as a way to assess a community and, and being able, we found that breaking down those subscales of, of membership, of belonging, of influence and shared um, uh, meeting needs and shared emotional connections are, are ways to begin to assess a community in areas that you can be able to strengthen. Um, so this, using, you can focus on those subscales. Um, you know, we don't do that analysis for people. We aren't at that point of ability to do that, but it is something, it's an easy enough scale to score and others can do that. So you can provide feedback and we've worked with groups, working with the subscales and beginning to develop strategies from there, which we'll talk about next time as well. So I just wanted to add that the subscales can really reveal a lot of action rather in addition to the global sense of community. There's a question about building community power and under resourced neighborhoods and seeing and see what pathway to build power building um, being increasing social capital um, by creating spaces for connection between high and low socioeconomic people. Um, 
and the research of this is strong. So the this strengthening community framework is actually building on some of these social capital concepts. It talks about bonding inside community. And so if a community members bond among themselves and they get strong, then what they need to do is bridge. So then two communities come together and they can bridge. And then remember what David said about communities being nested. So it is a, a dynamic process because there are always communities within communities. So you're trying to strengthen the bonding among a group of people and then they're trying to bridge with another group of people. So now you have bridging. And then the third piece is linking it to the systems, the institutions that may have power, right? And exerting your collective efficacy to be able to transform those systems so that they're more responsive and more supportive of the people who you know, need access to those resources and opportunities that these institutions manage. So that's really the idea. And so there's a, a lot of research about the importance of bonding, bridge, and linking, the importance of social capital um, inside of the strength of community framework and sense of community. Uh, thank you. And if I can just jump in on one more, uh, on answering a question that's related to this, because it's coming up. I just want to emphasize to focus on, on what's in common among people. If you're gonna work across SES groups, there's a, one of the few, uh, we did a, another uh, set of literature review a few years ago around you know building intergroup relations and what works um, in terms of that. And, and what came through in the literature, and it's still true today, and it's one of the most, the few psychological social science theories that just play out like gravity, is the importance of that common positive event, working on something that's important to you and having positive contact. So in asking how to work building power, as Ken used the example among the have and have not, the French Canadian community, along with the Latino community who are at odds for debt. Uh, decades with each other, found the commonality around their kids being exposed to um, uh, unsafe school bus stops, okay? And that was the basis for them to come together and work across class and culture to be able to work on those things. So if there's anything that's a takeaway strategically, is finding those commonalities for people to work on together. And that's how attitudes change. As much as we like to think that people change their attitudes by new information and realizing what they're doing is bad, I think we all know from personal experience that's not how it plays out in reality. It's really that people change their behavior and then try to explain why it was that way. So if you're working with a group that you always thought was inept and corrupt and the cause of crime and find out they share the values and begin that you have and begin to work with them, your attitudes change. Um, I think also the dynamic of, of looking at how to begin to address the, um, those divisions um, that may come that is through that same process of working together. So I just yeah, wanted... and I want to add to what you, David, you said, which is, that, that, I mean, it's we're not looking for a kumbaya moment. It's, yeah, it, that's not what this is about, right? This is about finding that one common issue that then you can take up because you share that common issue no matter where you sit in the community. Um, and seeing how to act on that common issue, which will affect people differently. And, and, and for those who don't have the privilege, it's going to disproportionately affect their health or whatever and create disparities. And for those that have access to resources may not see that way. But if they can see that they're part of a community that they share through one or more of these elements, then you are hoping that people will start to care for one another. And by caring for one another, you're going to want to make sure everybody's doing well. Yeah. Do you want people you care about to be treated fairly? I think another part of that that Ken said, and I think that just adds to the questions that are coming up, is the that it's not a kumbaya moment. It's not like we get, it's not artificial moments. It's like how to deal with real conflicts. And other research that we've done, we've seen that groups, coalitions, cross intergroup, uh, intergroup, interclass um, uh, uh, efforts, have worked because they had the ability to transform that conflict. They didn't hide it. They didn't manage it off to the side. They were able to explicitly address the differences between groups and build their capacity to be able to say, 
there's going to be a change because you're getting more than me or your group is getting more than I goes, what are we going to do about it? Rather than seeing all these problems as individual issues and taking people off to the side and saying, you guys have to work this out. They're saying, oh no, it's a group problem and we're going to work on dealing with those inequities as a group and talk it through and be able to successfully address it. So it's not a conflict-free situation. It's addressing these things. Just like embedding the... Um, embedding these values of diversity and inclusion, okay? It's not something that will necessarily happen. There'll be times when it has to be brought into the process. And so that, so creating that culture, those values of a community, they only, they bring common values in, but they're also, because we're so influenced by our communities, you can help change those values, values to positive things as easy as, as people are now using it for negative things. Okay. Um, I have a question. Is, that, is, is there a place to find national data on the importance and the effectiveness of community engagement and the outcomes of self and community efficacy? There is, there, and I'm forgetting the name of the study, but if we can pass that on. There is that. I know the Robert Johnson study has done that, and I believe there is a study by the University of Chicago that looks at community, community participation study. It's now escaping me, um, the name of it. But the effectiveness is really through a lot of research. It's not a single study. A survey will, the surveys right now, the annual surveys just talk about the level of um, outcomes, a, a level of participation, and whether it's going up and down and from which groups. And there was a recently publication on that. But the, the literature is pretty pretty extensive for a very long time that people and just engagement, people being involved in their communities, again, they're all tied together with the mental, physical, and social well-being. People who are more involved tend to be healthier. People, people with mental, uh, with, with uh, uh, behavioral health challenges have um, been able to, by through getting engaged in their services, really exceed their treatment goals. Um, you know, so there's a lot of research on this, but not one single place for it, unfortunately. The yeah, health benefits, also... I would say that there's a work in hardiness, which shows the health benefits of people's resilience, greater resistance to illnesses. It's really so fundamental. I think one of the things that my, my, Marisa and Ken and I talk about, it's like the thing about this is that it's not a proprietary secret weapon. This is essential human behavior. The human ecology is community. Okay, if there's any message I would like to get across is that this is not something that we invented at community science. What we are is talking about a fundamental human experience like love and hope that how to bring that into our social strategies rather than trying to consider it in the background as something else. It's not a workshop, okay? It's really about a fundamental human process that we begin to challenge. And that's why I think Dr. King really focused on it through his speeches, that it wasn't just the marches, but that whole idea that eventually he understood as well, that we're in it together. And that through that process of community that people thrived. And I would say, David and Marisa, from your experience, it's it's it takes time, right? This is yeah. not this is not that there's no magic wand that you can wave and that sense of community will change overnight. I mean, you know, if I if I look at the what Marisa said about organizations and you know David and I have been both part of community science for over 20 years I mean it takes time and in an organization like ours it's dynamic I mean there are moments when I can say I felt like we had a really strong sense of community and we were just you know chugging away doing well and then there can be an event that can really disrupt that and that sense of community then gets shaky and you have to go back and figure out how to rebuild it, strengthen it. I mean, it is a very dynamic process. Yeah. And, and, and it does take that. And I think just go back to the uh, my, uh, my memory lane here, but I think that um, one of the things in terms of you want to look at collective efficacy, which comes from community. Collective efficacy is another way to look at that community power, that collective thing. A very important, I think one of the best and well-funded and extensive studies was Samson and Radenbush. And you can look those up around collective efficacy, where they showed that given for equal levels of poverty, um, you know, in at different neighborhoods in Chicago, that those that had a higher sense of collective efficacy had lower violence, better health, 
a lot of other benefits. So at least I can give Maddie and others who are asking for some research at least one tip right now for where to look for that. But I think it's very important to realize that part of the problem with science, social sciences, everybody has a different name for the same thing. And that makes it hard. But if you follow that theme, you're just going to see that most of the sciences or social sciences are built around the sense that we have a sense of community, a sense of control, and we sense that we have enough cash to survive and live a good life. Um, we have a question. It says, how have you addressed conflicts that have came up during those positive events? Um, have there been instances where those events have made conflicts worse? or there has been disagreements in how to address the common issue. And David, I think you've mentioned that a little bit earlier. Yeah, I think, yeah, of course, I'm first to say that not everything works, everything we've done or anybody else works. So yeah, everything has, something has always gone wrong with something um, that we tried. I think the where it is, is that I think that the key part in the short, where we've seen it work, and where I've seen it work when we work groups, is putting the issues on the table and being able to discuss it as a group. It's a group ownership of the issue you know, um, and not personalizing it. Um, it goes wrong when it's kept to be personal. It's very important. I think, Marisa, you could probably talk about some of this, about some of the ground rules, you know, about that, pro about a process that, that is able to do that, um, you know, because it's, we, we don't know how to talk, culture, many cultural differences for many different reasons, how we talk differently. So, Marisa, do you have some thoughts about how to really facilitate a conversation around that? Oof. I mean, it really just depends. It really truly depends. But I think setting ground rules um, is is always a good first step. Um, I think some of those include like, you know, speaking in I statements or, you know, um, accepting non-closure or, you know, making sure that um, you don't count your own or that just because somebody else is experiencing something differently than you uh, doesn't mean it's not part of the truth as well. Um, so I think there are several ground rules that you can set with, you know, when you're working with groups together. Um, but that's the only thing that comes to mind for me right now. I'm I'm kind of holding a little bit back <laughs> because I want to say I don't want to say everything for the next webinar. But yes, I I agree. Okay, I think it's important. Uh, yeah, and I think it does, it takes, I think there's really something that we don't do is we don't really, um, you know, it's not saying that community science has this training package we're rolling out next month, okay? Yeah. Um, what it really is about is I really want to introduce, because we have to start, what we know is we have to start working on this issue. All of us that are trying to make change and promoting justice and equity, we have to improve our approaches Um to it, not that what we've done is wrong, but it can be better. And this is an important part of making it better. And so I think investing in facilitation, um, you know, there are groups, um, um, the can is better at, at naming groups, but the groups that provide training on how to facilitate for, for social justice, improving our facilitation skills and realizing that it's more than just writing things up on a whiteboard, okay, that that's not facilitation and traffic company, but knowing how to facilitate and investing in those things. Um, to answer the question about how it is tied to this is the focus on community capacity building to do this work. That's a, that's what we're focused on. It's a focus on systems is that we don't really have the capacity, nor do we think ultimately it's the best goal for us, given all the groups out there to work on supporting individual community organizing efforts. What we're interested in is setting up these systems to support community building and organizing at a city or state level so that there's a support system, an ecosystem for this for everybody and for every group that's really been historically disenfranchised to be able to be able to strengthen their community. That's a quick question from uh, David Harris. I wanted to see if we can answer. So hi, David. Um, so oh, yeah. um, he's asking if there's an ideal sample size for the SCI to be valid as a measure. Um, Ideal, you know, there's a general standard for fiscal reasons of around 30 participants. Um, you know, if you break it down, yeah, if, as long as you get that for the subscales, it should work. I mean, it's not a, the ideal would be at least, you know, uh, the, there's a practical and a statistical ideal, okay? Um, and the statistical ideal is the sampling uh, methods for that, not to oversample you know, so you get a representative sample, but that generally those things are available on the web, sampling um, scales. Um, 
I think that the, the practical one is like, you know, is is because of that sense of ownership is to get as many people in that community as, as reasonably possible. So it's a combination of, of classic sampling techniques, um, but also realizing that um, you really want people to have that sense of commonality and ownership of it. So um, if it's a scientific study, then they're sampling techniques that are available and power analysis that you can do. Uh, several, like again, easy tools on the web that you can use looking for power analysis and sampling size. But I think for an intervention point of view, it's to get as many people as possible. That's my opinion. And I'm sure there's others because not everybody feels the same way about that issue. But I do think there are two worlds in there. I guess, um, David, can you say what the research is for the collective efficacy? Again, um, it was Samson and Radenbush, uh, Robert Samson, University of Chicago, and, um, and I'm forgetting, this is where I really, this is the main of my existence is not remembering the name of all the articles, but um, um, I'm sure somebody else can do it. Or again, if you write us, uh, at, uh, at least uh, you can, we have our, our, um, our addresses, I think, at the end, but you can write info at communityscience.com. Um, and that we'll be able to do that. Um, so Ken. I guess it's 1.02 PM. So it's, we are supposed to stop at one. So I want to respect everyone's time. I want to say thank you everybody for being here today. Thank my wonderful colleagues, David, Marisa, Dante for being here. And I hope, you know, we hope to see you at the next webinar where we will tell you more since Marisa was just starting to give you a little bit of a, a, a way here. So hope to see you in June and we'll talk about interventions and um, evaluation strategies and getting real practical. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, evening, afternoon, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Kian, Marisa and Dante. Thank you everyone.